Serve a good God. Serve a good God. So the title of my message tonight is called Breaking the Law. <laughs> Breaking the Law, okay? And there, there's an old saying. I'm sure some of you guys have heard this saying before. But rules are meant to be broken. Rules are meant to be broken. But have you ever wondered which laws are the most commonly broken by Americans? I mean, I'm sure you can guess number one. Shout out what you think number one is. All right, speeding. Everybody, like everybody got that. For those of you guys who aren't here, everybody guessed that, speeding. It's not a surprise that speeding is the, is the most broken law, the speed limit. I mean, when I moved to Houston about six years ago, I kid you not, I'm driving up 45, going to the woodlands. I'm already going 75 or 80. And guess what somebody did? They passed me on the shoulder. I'm like, okay, you Texans, y'all know how to speed, okay? <laughs> so I did a little Google search and roughly 112,000 people get a speeding ticket every single day. And the average speeding ticket in the United States is $150. So you do the math and figure out how much money people spend a year in America on speeding tickets. More than they spend on fireworks, okay? It's a lot. <laughs> Another common law that's broken, that's in the top five laws that's broken, is driving while using your cell phone. Driving while using your cell phone. In 41 states, it is against the law to use your cell phone while driving. Did you know in Texas, it is illegal to use your cell phone while driving? All right? So how many of you guys here have ever broken the law? Put your hands up. Don't be shy. Have you ever sped? Have you ever grabbed your phone while you're driving in your car? Have you ever walked across the street and didn't use the crosswalk? Right? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Like, if you guys were here a few weeks back when I was here, I told you, like, I've broken a few laws in my life. All right? Before Christ, like, in one hour, I got three public intoxications, three disorderly conducts, and one open container. And I tell you what, those weren't the first laws that I broke. Okay? All of us have broken the law in some form or some fashion, whether it's man's law or whether it's God's law. Sometimes we get caught and sometimes we don't. But guess what? God always knows, right? We are all law breakers. And I could easily do a message on that topic alone, that we are law breakers and that we are saved by grace, right? But that's not what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Instead, I, I wanna ask another question. Did you know, did you know that Jesus broke the law. Kind of. Not really, kind of, but not really. Let me explain, okay? So open up your Bibles to John chapter nine. And as you're opening up to John chapter nine, I'm gonna pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We worship you, Lord God. I pray that you would speak to us through your words, Lord God, that we would leave today, Lord God, recognizing who you are, our personal Lord and Savior. Amen. John chapter nine. Let me explain myself here. So as you're turning there, I wanna ask you another question. I just want you to think about this one. Who are some of the most influential people that you can think of? Like if you were gonna make a list of the top most influential people ever, who would be on that list for you? I mean, I did a Google search to figure out like who other people think the most influential people of all time are. And it's, in, it's interesting, it's obvious to me, but somewhat surprising to me. But every single list I looked up, guess who was on it? Jesus Christ was in the top 10 of every list that I looked up. And that kind of shocked me because we live in this kind of uh, secular world, but technically he's God and he's not human. So like, can you really make the list? But a, a few other people were people like Martin Luther King Jr., Muhammad Ali, Gandhi, Steve Jobs, Einstein. There were actually uh, several uh, biblical people on there. Uh, Paul the Apostle made several lists. Moses made several lists. Peter made several lists. And I say all that to say this. Influence, influence plays a huge part in being a good leader. 
And if you would have asked the Pharisees and the religious leaders during Jesus's time who that they thought should make the list of the most influential people, guess who they would have said? They would have said themselves. They would have been like us. We, we are, right? And it's interesting because Roger, this last weekend, when he preached, he talked about being humble, right? Not thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to. However, the religious leaders during Jesus's time, they may have thought that they were humble, but they weren't. I mean, we all know a person or two like that, right? They think that they're the most humble person in the world, but in reality, they're not. Instead, the religious leaders, instead of being humble, they were prideful, right? They were prideful. They thought that they knew everything. And here's the thing that we know about pride, okay? Pride separates us from God. So the religious leaders, they are a perfect example of pride. They were prideful in how they knew the scriptures. They knew what we call the Old Testament. They knew it really well, right? They had it memorized, right? So they were prideful in the scriptures, but guess what? That separated them from Jesus, right? The religious leaders, they didn't think that they had done anything wrong. They followed the laws. They followed the scripture to the T. And here's the thing. Have you ever heard somebody say, saved? What do I need to be saved from? I'm a good person. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Like, if you ask a non-Christian who's genuinely a good person, if they're saved, they're going to be like, what do I need to be saved from? And that's the religious leaders during Jesus's time. That was their mindset. They followed the laws. It was actually all of you. Y'all are lawbreakers, not us, right? We do everything that we need to do according to the scripture, according to the law. According to the religious leaders, they had never been a slave to anything or anybody because obviously we're descendants of Abraham. Right? That was their mindset, right? The, the, I love it because the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they really thought that they were the cat's meow. Like they were convinced that they were changing the world. And they actually did kind of help change the world, didn't they? How'd they do that? How did they help change the world? They killed Jesus. <laughs> I mean, Jesus' death was the precursor to one of history's greatest events. Right? Because without the death, there could be no what? Resurrection, right? And the greatest event of all history, of all history, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's because of that event, we have God's atoning work on the cross. Right? And in the Gospels, the religious leaders, they were so confident in their ability of knowing the Old Testament scripture. They thought that they knew all the scripture and they thought the ones who were blind was everybody else, but it was truly them who were blind, right? The religious leaders, they thought that they were beacons of light in the darkness. They studied the scriptures. And when they would read things like Deuteronomy chapter 32, Deuteronomy 32 says, children of God are above reproach in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation, and, and they shine like stars in the world. And I can guarantee when the religious leaders, when the Pharisees, they studied this, they thought God was talking about them, right? We are the ones who are above reproach in this crooked world. We are the ones who are above reproach in, in, in this perverse generation. We are the stars in this dark, dark world world, right? But little did they know that they themselves were the ones that were stumbling around in the darkness. And in John chapter nine, it's kind of like the blind leading the blind, right? And here's what I've, I've been studying the gospels a lot, a lot. And going through the gospels, there's one thing that I've seen over and over and over again. Sometimes the most enlightened people, <laughs> Right? The most enlightened ones are really the ones who need the biggest reality check, right? And so in John chapter nine, Jesus heals a blind man who was born blind. And on his second encounter with this man, he opens up his spiritual eyes. And it's important to note that this is the only miracle written in the gospel where Jesus healed somebody that was born with a birth defect, 
I mean, skeptics couldn't say that this was some kind of psychological cure. Skeptics couldn't say that this was some kind of trick on Jesus's part. Everybody knew this man. They knew that he was blind. They knew that his blindness was from a birth defect and it was a condition that, was, that he couldn't recover from, right? Because I, I don't know about you, but like I've talked to people and I'm like, man, I've been praying for this person and God healed them. And my skeptic friends, they go, well, Jesus didn't heal them. The doctor did. You went to the doctor and the, do- and the doctor gave them medication. The doctor did this or that or the other thing, right? But in this story, there is no doubt that Jesus healed this man. So John chapter nine, verse one says this. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind from birth. Now, it's important to understand the context or what led up to this point in the story, right? Jesus was evading the Pharisees because the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were trying to kill him. And why were they trying to kill him? Well, it's pretty simple. He claimed that God was his father. He was telling people to eat his flesh, to drink his blood, okay? He was telling the religious leaders, look, you don't know God. Actually, guess what? Your father is Satan. (laughs) Like, so the religious leaders, they were looking for any chance that they had to try to kill Jesus. And in my flesh, I think to myself, how, can you blame them? Jesus just told them everything that they had spent their entire lives doing. They were devoted to God. Everything they had spent their entire lives doing was worthless. And instead of serving God, they were actually children of the devil. Then I snapped back into reality and I realized that the religious leaders, they didn't want to know the truth, right? They didn't want to know the truth. And that's why Jesus told them that because they were acting like their father, the father of lies. They were believing the lies. They were spreading the lies. So that's where this story picks up, right? Jesus is being, is being hunted down. People want to kill him. And yet he stops to help a blind man, right? And this isn't like a blind Bartimaeus moment, right? Do you guys remember blind Bartimaeus? Another blind gentleman, right? When he hears that Jesus is in town, he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Right? But this man in John chapter 9, guess what he doesn't do? He doesn't cry out to Jesus. Right? And even though Jesus is running from people who are trying to kill him, he still takes the time to stop and help a blind sinner. Now, here's the thing that I've learned. I'm not that old, but I've learned a few things in my few years here on earth. And the one thing I've learned is that you want to look for patterns in people's lives right? If you look at patterns in people's lives, guess what that tells you? It shows you what they're likely to do next. If they've done something over and over and over again, it's likely that they're going to continue to do it in the future. We can learn a lot when we look at people's patterns in their lives, right? And so let's look at a pattern in Jesus's life because Jesus did something very similar to this before with the woman at the well. Are you guys all familiar with the story of the woman at the well? Like he went out of his way to help a sinner. And you have to remember the woman at the well, she was living in an area that the Jews didn't travel in, Samaria, right? That's almost like a dirty word to the Jews. Like the Jewish people hated the Samaritans so much that they considered them to be dogs. They literally would go the long way around so they didn't have to go through Samaria, right? And so one time Jesus was traveling from Judea to Galilee and the fastest route to get there, guess what? Is a straight line. But guess where that straight line took them through? Samaria, right? Samaria. And remember, I already told you that the the Jewish people, they would literally just go the long way around. So they didn't even have to step foot in there, but not Jesus, right? Jesus broke the cultural norms. He went out of his way to help a Samaritan woman who never asked for his help. She wasn't even aware of who Jesus was, right? But he did that because he wanted to save her soul. 
And here again, we see that exact same thing happening in John chapter nine. Right? Jesus goes out of his way to help somebody who doesn't call out to him. And it's more than just a physical healing that happens, right? So picking back up in the story in verse 2, the disciples asked Jesus, Rabbi, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or the sins of his parents? So the disciples, they raised this like interesting theological question. From their point of view, there's only two choices. Either he sinned in the womb or his parents sinned while he was in the womb, right? And so during this time, rabbis would teach that if you were born with a birth defect, it was because of sin. Either your sin, and some rabbis actually taught that you could sin while you were in the womb and you had to pay the price for that for the rest of your life. Ugh. or it was your parents' sin, right? I mean, this is kind of an idea that has been taught all the way back since the time of Job. Does everyone know who Job is, right? They taught that pain and illness was caused by specific sin, and Job had to go through some horrific things, didn't he? He lost his children, he lost his possessions, he lost his health, and his friends... Not very good friends, but his friends thought it was all because he had sinned, right? Now, it's interesting because after the disciples asked that, Jesus doesn't go into this long explanation of how sin and suffering are connected. First off, probably because it's not necessarily true, right? Guess what? Sins have consequences, Would everyone agree on that? Sins have consequences, and guess what? Sometimes those consequences are painful, right? I mean, the problem is though, I don't think that you can sin while you're in the mother's womb and your parents sinning while you are in the womb, it doesn't cause you to have a birth defect. I think the main reason that Jesus doesn't go into a theological answer though is because you have to realize that just a short time after this event, Jesus is going to be put to death, right? And so it almost seems like the time for this deep theological insight had passed. Instead, instead, what Jesus could do by healing this man would say so much more than just a long talk about a theological discussion, right? So he wanted to show them something. And so in verse three, after the disciples ask him, is it his sin or is it his parents' sin? Jesus replies, it was not because of his sin or his parents' sin. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. Again, remember, this blind beggar, he didn't request any favors from Jesus. He wasn't trying to gain access to Jesus. Like, we'll we'll come to understand that he's actually unaware of who Jesus even is, right? And so without even speaking to the guy, according to the text that we have, Jesus goes up and in verse six and seven, it says, he spits on the ground, he makes mud with his saliva, he spreads the mud on this guy's eyes, and then he tells the guy, go and wash in the pool of Shalom. Now, put, I like to put myself in people's positions. Put yourself in this guy's position. He's literally sitting there. He can't see anything. Imagine if you're blind and you don't ask for help from anybody. I mean, you're, you're, you're maybe asking for change, but you don't ask somebody to heal you. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, some guy just comes up and slaps mud on your face. <laughs> I'd be a little upset, right? Like, Jesus doesn't ask him if he can do that. And the man was probably startled. And the onlookers, it must have startled them as well. You have this blind man with mud on his face crossing Jerusalem to go into this pool, but the blind man, guess what he did? He obeyed Jesus. And in verse seven, it said, he went away, he washed, and he came back seeing. (laughs) God gave him his physical sight as a result of his obedience. I say this a lot, but obedience leads to blessing. God doesn't bless disobedience. Let me say that again. God doesn't bless disobedience. And that's important because this guy, 
He could have not done what Jesus told him to do. After all, Jesus just smacked a bunch of mud in his face. Jesus probably didn't smack it in his face. (laughs) But Jesus just put some mud in this guy's eyes, right? But this set up another pattern, another thread, right? The blind man had started a habit of responding to Jesus, and that would eventually lead him to him getting his spiritual awakening, right? And so obviously after this miracle happened, there was a tremendous uproar, right? The people were undoubtedly confused, right? This man who they knew had been blind, when they figured out who he was, right? And what had happened, they were confused. And so in verse 10, it says, they ask him, who healed you and what happened? Who healed you and what happened? And here's the thing. This guy didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't have a theological explanation for this. Heck, he didn't even have a rational explanation. This dude put mud in my eyes, right? All he could do was recount the circumstances that led to him gaining his sight. What did he do? He shared his testimony, Shared his testimony like I did a couple weeks ago. And in verse 11, it says, the man they call Jesus put mud, made mud, spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Shalom and wash yourself. So I went and washed and now I can see. And I love that because at this point in the story, it's the man they call Jesus, right? Not him. It's not personal yet. And so when the Pharisees found out that Jesus had applied clay or mud to this guy's eyes and he told them to go wash them, the Pharisees became furious. Why? Because it was on the Sabbath, right? And according to rabbinical law, Jesus had violated the Sabbath by working, right? Jesus is breaking the law, or so they say. They say, not me. Again, you have to look for threads, right? Jesus had done this before. In John chapter five, Jesus healed a man who had been lame for almost 40 years. Guess what day he did it on? The Sabbath. Jesus is such a rebel, right? And when Jesus healed that guy who hadn't walked in almost 40 years, guess what the Pharisees did? They got mad at him and it said they sought to kill him, right? The religious leaders were convinced that Jesus couldn't be from God because he healed somebody on the Sabbath because he was a lawbreaker, right? Jesus healed somebody on the the religious leader on a day that the religious leaders considered holy, right? Because the Sabbath was meant to be a day of rest and a day of worship to God. However, (laughs) We know that the religious leaders, they didn't take things like a little too far. They took things like way too far, right? I I told you this before, but they made some outlandish rules when it came came to working on the Sabbath, right? Like here nowadays, we use like scope and we gargle it to clean our teeth. Well, they didn't have scope in those days. They used vinegar. So on the Sabbath, it was okay to drink vinegar, but it was not okay to gargle vinegar because if you gargled vinegar on the Sabbath, what was it? You're working and you're a lawbreaker. Another silly law they had about the Sabbath was it's okay to eat an egg that a chicken laid on the Sabbath, but the next day you have to kill the chicken because it worked on the Sabbath. They didn't take it a little too far. They took it way too far. And so when Jesus healed on the Sabbath, the religious leaders rolled up to Jesus like a bunch of Karens or a bunch of Chads, right? And if you don't know what that is, it's just somebody who's highly opinionated and they're gonna tell you what they think and it's usually in an aggressive manner, right? So they roll up on Jesus and they are not happy and they lay into Jesus because he healed somebody who had been lame for almost 40 years, right? Right? I mean, think about this. Jesus healed this man in John chapter five who had not walked in almost 40 years and all they cared about was the day of the week that he did it on. (laughs) So in John chapter five, when the religious leaders accused Jesus of breaking the law, I love how Jesus responds. He said, my father is always working and so am I. 
My father is always working and so am I. You see, Jesus was always quick to give credit to God the Father, right? And he's claiming here that it was God the Father, not himself, who actually did this miracle. So in other words, Jesus is claiming that God the Father is the one that's breaking the law, not him. (laughs) So no wonder they wanted to kill Jesus, right? No wonder. And so the same thing is happening The religious leaders are acting the exact same way here in John chapter nine, the passage that we're studying tonight. So for the remainder, the most of the remainder of John chapter nine, it tells us how the religious authorities, they're frantically seeking witnesses to support their disbelief. They are are, are passionately looking for people to talk against Jesus, right? They, they are, in their minds, they're convinced that Jesus had committed a sin by working on the Sabbath. And so they're trying to do everything that they can to disprove the validity of this miracle. And so by doing that, as they're doing that, the Pharisees go up to the blind man in verse 24 and they say this, give glory to God. We know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. So what are the Pharisees really saying there? What they're saying to him is, stop telling everybody Jesus did this. Don't tell people Jesus did this. Instead, give glory to God. Because we know that Jesus couldn't have done this because this man, he's a sinner. (laughs) Of course, you know, they had no proof that Jesus had done anything wrong, right? But they had already decided in their minds that Jesus was a what? Was a sinner and that he was not from God. Right? Even when all the information pointed to the fact that Jesus was sent from God, they stood firm in their disbelief. Right? They had already made their minds up, and the facts, guess what? The facts weren't going to change their mind. I mean, doesn't that sound like the world we live in today? I mean, that sounds like what we live in today, right? People have, they have determined their truth, Right? And the absolute truth that's found in the word of God won't change their minds. <laughs> I'll say this. If the Bible calls it sin, your truth, your opinions don't matter. Neither do mine. Right? If the Bible calls it truth, our opinions don't matter. Because God's word is absolute truth. Right? And we can take that to the bank. And so I love these next couple lines because when I picture the way that the blind man responds to the Pharisees, I picture him like a 12-year-old boy saying this to a parent in the most sarcastic tone of voice that a person could say it in, right? So the Pharisees just said, Go, give God credit. Don't give Jesus this sinner credit. And the, in verse 25, the man says, whether he is a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know is that once I was blind, but now I see. (laughs) He questioned their convictions that Jesus had committed a sin. And so the the religious leaders at that point, they frantically asked the identical questions to the man that they had already asked him. In verse 26, they say, what did he do to you? And how did he open your eyes? And here's the thing. If you back somebody into a corner, Okay? If you back somebody into a corner, especially somebody that has authority and they think they have authority over you, they think that they can ask the same questions, but if they say it a little louder and a little angrier, it's going to change your answer. But there's nothing to change here, right? That's not what happened with this blind man, right? And I love how he responds. How did he open your eyes? They already asked him this question, right? And at this point, Remember, he's not blind. (laughs) So yeah, he must have seen the anger building up inside of him, almost like a teapot getting ready to spout, right? And he says to the religious leaders in verse 27, I told you once, didn't you listen? Like I just picture him 12-year-old sarcastic. I told you once, didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? And this is my favorite part. Do you, do you want to become his disciple too? It's like, I mean, this simple, obvious logic behind this blind man actually vanquishes their attacks, 
right? The religious leaders, they thought that they were in control of this debate, but obviously it's clear who's in control of this debate and it's not them, right? And so the blind man goes on in verse 32 and 33, says this, ever since the beginning, ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he could not have done this. Notice, I love this. Notice, as the religious leaders become more and more antagonistic, the blind man's faith in Jesus becomes stronger, right? The more they questioned him, the more convincing his testimony became, right? And our faith, when our faith is put to the test and when people start questioning us about our faith, guess what it does? It'll strengthen our faith. It'll show us where we stand with the Lord. And so when all else fails, the religious leaders, they start making fun of this guy and they kick him out of the synagogue. And what's interesting to me is that this is the first person ever mentioned in the Bible who was expelled from the synagogue for the sake of Jesus. It's interesting to me. Pastor Steve, if you want to come up. However, we know that the story doesn't end there, right? Guess what? When, we accept, when, when Jesus heals us, our story never ends there, right? His transformation isn't over. He obeyed Jesus. He even defended Jesus against the Pharisees, which is a big deal, right? But he had not yet experienced a new birth. Remember what John chapter three says. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So even though this man could see physically, right? He had not yet seen the kingdom of God. And so Jesus started looking for this man after he learned that he had been expelled from the synagogue. Once again, we see a pattern, right? Jesus is looking for this man. The beggar, this blind guy, he's not seeking out Jesus. Jesus sought him out. Remember what Jesus said, that I would leave the 99 for the one, right? So we see that pattern here. And when Jesus finds this blind man, Jesus asks him, do you believe in the son of man? Do you believe in the son of man? And at this point, the blind beggar's heart was wide open. I picture it like the Grinch, whose heart grew 10 sizes and his boing, just breaks that little box, right? And in verse 36, the blind man says, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Right, he had such faith in Jesus that at that moment, Jesus could have pointed out anybody. It's that guy right there. And this guy would have believed Jesus because he had that much faith in him. But compare that to the Pharisees who refused to listen to Jesus because they believed they had all the answers. How many of you guys know that it's hard to hear from God when you've already decided what you want him to say? It's hard to hear from God when you've already decided what you want him to say. And that's the Pharisees, that's the religious leaders. And if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes that's us, right? Sometimes we ask God to bless things in our lives when we're determined to do them no matter what. I've said this before, but I think we all have a little Pharisee inside of us, right? But that's why we walk in this process of sanctification, drawing nearer and closer to Christ every single day. We should be moving forward, not stagnant or moving backwards. So the religious leaders, they were well-versed in scripture. They had a wealth of theological knowledge, yet their intentional disbelief caused their hearts to be blind. In verse 37 and 38, Jesus says to the blind man, when he asked, the blind man said, who is the son of man that I may believe in him? And Jesus says, you have both seen him and he is the one talking to you. And the blind man said, Lord, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. The blind man didn't hesitate. He didn't demand evidence. 
his spiritual eyes were open. He saw Jesus as Lord and he responded in faith. And then I love what verse 38 said. It says, it says, and he worshiped him. The blind man worshiped Jesus. He fell to his knees and worshiped him. And that is a beautiful ending to this story. Amen. Stand with me if you will. I think a lot of people say this. My life changed when I made Jesus my savior. I have said that. I was a drug addict, alcoholic, bottom of the barrel person until I made Jesus the Lord of my life. But the question is not about making Jesus our Lord. When the scales fell off, this blind man spiritualized. When the scales fell off our spiritual eyes and the blind man saw Jesus for who he was, the only possible response was to fall to his knees and worship God and worship the Lord. And if Jesus is who he says he is, there is only one response that we can have, right? Here's the thing. We don't make Jesus anything. He is the Lord. He is God. We just have to acknowledge that. Amen. Here's what I want all of us to do before we leave. If the scales have fallen off your spiritual eyes, before you leave, whether it's in the altar, whether it's at your seat, I want you to take a moment and fall to your knees at the throne of the Lord. Take a moment and reflect to reaffirm who Jesus is in your life. Is he your Lord? If he is your Lord, guess what? He is your savior and he deserves to be worshiped. Feel the excitement of meeting Jesus, the son of man, worship him just like this blind beggar did. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you. I worship you, Lord God. Thank you for allowing us to come into your house to study your word. But more than that, thank you for being our Lord. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for allowing this, this, our spiritual eyes to be opened. I pray tonight, Lord God, that we would come back to our first love. Just like when this gentleman in John chapter nine saw Jesus for the first time and saw that he was Lord and he fell down and worshiped him. I pray that we come back to that moment right now, Lord. That we take this time, Lord Jesus, to acknowledge who you are in our lives. No matter what you've done or what you're going to do, Lord God, you've already done enough. You sacrificed yourself willingly on the cross, Lord God, for all of our sins. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We praise you for breaking the law and healing us on the Sabbath. We praise you for everything that you've done in our lives, Lord God, to allow us to leave the baggage of our old selves behind and move towards the new creation, being the new creation that you have called us to be. I pray all these things in Christ Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen. The altars are open. Please take some time and fall before the Lord. We fall down.